Something special is happening on the Wellesley College campus. There's a large effort led by Christine Cruz Vergara to reimagine career services. I sat down with her to unpack what is it like to lead a massive change? What is it like to think about new staff competencies needed? And, and how do we integrate into the campus ecosystem to do something radically different, something innovative, something extraordinary, something uniquely helpful? So we've been talking a lot about uh, reimagining and change, mm -hmm. and but a really important component of that is staff, mm -hmm. the the hiring of great people, and you've hired 19 yes. in one year. That's enormous. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot. Yes, definitely. <laughs> uh, and we've talked about how hiring can be pretty slow, mm -hmm. but you're moving at a quick pace. Mm -hmm. So describe a little bit about the culture of your staff that you've set that's allowed you to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I think one piece that is incredibly core to the way in which our team functions um, and a, a new culture that we've set is being extremely clear, extremely direct, and extremely transparent in our communication. Um, anyone that's ever worked with me knows that that's incredibly important to me and that's just the way in which I lead and function. Um, and I think that's really served our team really well. So when we think about the existing staff that I had as I came into Wellesley, while all of them were certainly excited about the possibility and the opportunity for what we could build, there was also a level of anxiousness around sure. not knowing me, sure. not knowing what the process would look like, not knowing if their roles might change, and that's all very understandable. Mm -hmm. So one of the first things I did um, on my first day arriving was to set the tone and to share with them the case study prompt and the process of change that I was asked to speak about in my interview with all of the other stakeholders, uh -huh. I gave them the exact same answer that I gave everybody else in the interview process so that they knew what I was sharing with the president, with the cabinet, with the provost, with the other division heads was exactly the same information that I was sharing with them as well. There were no secrets. Um, and I think that allowed them to also understand this is the process. We're engaging in the listening tour. Then we're going to start to build the vision. They're going to be part of the process of crafting what that org chart might look like. Then we're going to vet it against some people's ideas and thoughts. Then we'll start to roll out, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. They kind of had a, a good wireframe or framework for what that might look like for the next year, essentially. Um, and then with new staff, the clear and direct transparent communication allowed them to not have to question people's motives as they were coming into a new environment, one that is very much startup, mm -hmm. um, but within a wider, more established culture. Mm -hmm. um, and it allowed them to not only focus on what it was they were trying to learn with their role, but to just get to know people for face value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and not have to worry about some of those dynamics because naturally we're already going to have to get used to each other's styles mm -hmm. and differences um, in that way. So I think the communication piece has been really, really important um, so that people know I will share with them always what I know from my vantage point because I am trusting them mm -hmm. to be professionals and to use that information as they need and to ask questions when they don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and that allows them in turn to be transparent and to share information back with me that could also be useful and with each other. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a one-way street, but it goes for our entire community and our entire team. Mm -hmm. it, it seems like this value of flexibility that you've talked about with your staff is pretty crucial mm -hmm. in, in this whole reimagined process and, and rethinking career services. Deep dive on it for us though. Is it, is it, could it be willy-nilly? Is it unthoughtful? Like, help us understand that there's a foundation behind it of some sort. Sure, there's definitely a foundation behind being flexible. Um, the idea, the concept of being flexible is that you have to have a structure or a uh, static form that you are flexing against or around for something to actually be flexible. I actually think flexibility uh, is a very intentional process and a very intentional action that you take when you're leading change. The overarching vision isn't changing. The overarching vision is still the vision that guides you and your work. But what needs to be flexible is how in which you might operationalize that. Tell us about your physical space. 
uh, <laughs> today okay. and perhaps in the future. And yeah. particularly, how, how has it shaped how you do tea? Sure. I'm laughing uh, because I'll show you our space <laughs> soon. <laughs> um, our current space is not ideal. Uh, so in our current space, we are a hallway that has 11 offices and we have 29 staff members. So we had to get pretty creative in how we uh, put staff and how we thought about the use of our space. And my director of operations, Jen Pollard, did a phenomenal job of figuring out where people could be placed in a way that would allow us to function and operate um, at a very high level and in a very seamless way for all of our different stakeholders. So what we decided to do was take all of our college career mentors and all of our career community advisors those are the positions that meet regularly with students and we got feedback from students saying they wanted to meet in private space so we gave all of those 11 advisors and mentors the closed offices so that they could meet with students and that meant everybody else moved into open space open office space including the directors including myself so my office is the only space we have that has a table for team meetings, for private one-on-ones. And so anyone on our team is able to reserve space in my office anytime. And whenever that happens, I simply go sit in my open office desk or in the hallway mm -hmm. or wherever there's an open chair. I'm on a laptop, so it really doesn't matter. Uh -huh. um, but it has allowed us to really rethink the use of our space. And so we're very fortunate. We have two amazing alumni that have given us um, an incredible lead gift that is helping us to really jumpstart a lot of the changes that we've been talking about. And one of those changes is redesigning new space for career education. So we're in the process of working with some new architects um, to actually design our new space. And we have decided after experiencing open office space for the past semester that we are actually electing to stick with that. Huh. And so even in our new building and our new space that we'll have um, only the college career mentors and the advisors will have closed office spaces and everybody else, including myself and all the directors, will sit in open office space. And we really believe that it has helped us to strengthen the community and the team camaraderie. Um, we're able to jump into conversations so much easier. We're sometimes able to problem solve and fix things um, at a much more rapid pace because we all just happen to be sitting together and might overhear things. Um, and that's allowed us to also see connections that otherwise we wouldn't have realized were there. What, so what have been one to two leadership principles that you've really grabbed onto over the last few years? Mm -hmm. Open and transparent communication. It's so fundamental and so core to who I am as a person and how I build relationships and how I lead. Um, I have found that by being really open and very direct, both in positive and constructive feedback, it has really built rapport and trust with my team. That allows us to really get past a lot of the noise and really cut to the core of what's important in how we work together and what we build. Um, so I think that kind of communication has built trust, it's built loyalty, um, it's allowed us to function at a very high level. Uh -huh. And for those that have worked with me before, I think it's also what keeps us close and continues to keep us connected even long after we've gone to different institutions and gone on to tackle new challenges and things like that as well. Uh -huh. um, I think the other principle um, that's been really core for me is understanding um, the differences in which different staff need to be related to. Mm -hmm. um, so many of us are familiar with the situational leadership theory. Mm -hmm. uh, I really use that framework and that concept in the way in which I supervise mm -hmm. um, and develop relationships as well. Understanding that people are growing beings, they're evolving, mm -hmm. and they all have different styles and needs. Mm -hmm. And so just as much as they are adapting to me mm -hmm. and how I work, I also need to be flexible enough to adapt to them uh -huh. and what they need to be supported uh -huh. and challenged. Uh -huh. In just a few words, mm -hmm. bright spots from hiring this many new staff. Um, the energy level has been incredible to have, obviously, 19 new people with uh -huh. fresh ideas and a fresh look on things. Um, you can't help but have extremely high energy for wanting to build this incredible vision that we have here at, um, at Wellesley. 
I think the other piece is there's a certain level of community that they have with each other uh -huh. because so many of them literally started on the same day uh -huh. together. And so there's that sense of, um, there's a certain bond that uh -huh. they have with each other around having been in it together uh -huh. at the same time. What about pain points? Well, I think anytime you're bringing on such a massive staff, large group together, um, it is hard to intentionally onboard everybody huh. in a way that allows everyone to actually feel oriented, that allows them to feel like they have enough information to hit the ground running, things like that. Um, so we had to think very carefully about what that looked like. And, and quite honestly, I think we learned a lot from that and mm -hmm. we would probably make some significant changes to how we, mm -hmm. how we onboarded our staff. Um, it's all gonna feel a little chaotic and a little crazy. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing is um, with such a large team, you're gonna go through those stages of team development uh, sometimes a lot faster than you anticipate. So we kind of went through our forming, storming, norming, performing <laughs> in a condensed uh, in a condensed version. Um, not only because we had so many people, but because the charge of implementing this change was fairly rapid, and um, we had to push through a lot of things. And that meant having to have some really intense, direct mm -hmm. conversations um, one on one with folks to make sure that we were holding people accountable and addressing issues immediately as they came up mm -hmm. um, and not letting that fester or grow bigger yeah. into other issues. Yeah. So we've talked a little bit about your staff, but mm -hmm. what do you think about when you think about managing up to mm -hmm. the people above you, the people that are helping support this broader mission? When I think about managing up, I think about the essence of what that really means. and. For me, what that means is how do we build a mutually beneficial, reciprocal relationship where I am supporting my boss in the same way that she is supporting me. So what does she need from me? Just like I ask the question, what do I need from her, right? And um, I think in terms of principles around managing up, one of the most important things you can do is pay attention to what types of questions your boss regularly asks you. I think that's really telling around what your supervisor or your boss finds to be important. Mm -hmm. So good to be with you. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. <laughs>